Hello, Donna. How are you doing? How's the signing going? Did you need some help on that one thing about... Yeah. Hey, show us how you do grace just real quick. Grace. Like, show us real quick. How you do it? Like this? Just that's all? And then an L. Okay, everybody did it real quick. Okay, got it. Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. Hey, things you... You're not going to learn that at every church. Just want to make sure you know that. But when you come to OVC, and we try to do a little bit extra for you every Sunday. Isn't that great? I love it. And then LaDonna, I, lo- I love having LaDonna and uh, all our people over here. That's so cool. God bless you guys. And uh, you're an important part of our church. And I-, I saw a bunch of people out in the third space. Just want to say hi to them if you're watching live stream. We're a church that has all these different venues, and yet we're one church and we have one purpose, and that is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Anybody say amen to that? So let me go into a couple things before I get into the sermon. One is I was on Facebook this week looking around, and I watch you. I follow you on Facebook, and I watch you. If we're not on Facebook together, uh, uh, ask to be my friend so I can be your friend, and I can watch you and find out if you're doing the right thing or not. And so, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. That is, that is not true. So, but anyways, it's true that I was looking on Facebook and uh, anybody know this? Uh, there's, there's this uh, famous person, Kathy Lee Gifford, I think. Anybody heard of her before? A couple people. And so she was on Facebook and she was being given an award. And the award that she was given was from the Nashville Pops Orchestra. And I don't know if she sang for them or whatever, but whatever she did, I don't know why she got the award. But I looked at the award and I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on one second here. And I want to show you the picture, the actual picture. I didn't do anything to this. Now look, forget who's in the picture. Look at what it's of. It's of a girl. Jesus is on his knees, a boy on his back. I went, whoa, that's us. That's... I wanted to go, Kathy, do you know where it's originally at? It's at our campus. And give that back. That's ours. (laughs) So that was kind of a cool thing that we saw this week. Um, If you're at her house, you can explain that to her, okay? If you happen to go visit sometime. Hey, uh, one of the great things we have in our church is we have a tremendous pastoral staff. We love our pastors, and our youth pastors are just, they just hit it out of the park. They are just rock stars. We have a senior high pastor, Pastor Nate. We have a middle school pastor, Pastor Hannah, and they're both fabulous. They both do such an incredible job teaching our kids about Jesus Christ and the difference he can make in their life, and it's such an important thing. Pastor Nate actually grew up in our church and uh, went to uh, college and seminary in Kansas City and then came back and he's been here six years. He's also also a chaplain in the military and we celebrate that. We think that is a really cool thing. So uh, Pastor Nate has been in the reserves and he'll uh, he'll spend a couple days uh, every month in the reserves being a chaplain and uh, they love him down there. In fact, they love him a little too much. They went to him recently and they said, hey, uh, you're doing such a great job. We really need you uh, to be full-time as a chaplain down at the Air Force here in Tucson. And uh, so uh, a couple weeks ago, we went and uh, had a meeting, and and Nate said, hey, listen, I just sense that God is saying, hey, this is the path that that, uh, I should go on. So we're going to be losing Nate. Here's the great news. And, and, and I love it. He looked at me and he said, hey, Craig, I'm really sorry. I looked at him and I said, there's no reason to be sorry. Amen? Come on. We're, we're cheering him on. There's, this is something we can be grateful that God has done a great work in his life. Come on. Isn't that right? Yeah. So Nate's going to go and he's going to uh, be a, a full-time chaplain in the military. The great thing about it is, even though he's leaving, he's staying here. He's actually going to be here at Davis Monthan and a uh, chaplain here. So his family's going to get to stay here. Laura's wife and his kids, Haley and Hannah, we love them. And uh, they're part of our family and they get to stay part of our family. All right. I want to show you one more picture. And that is that uh, uh, you, you guys do so much. And I don't always get to say, hey, here's the results of what you've done. But I wanted to make sure on this Thanksgiving Sunday that we showed you the results. Uh, There's a team of, uh, there was a small group actually that led uh, us giving coats 
to the gospel rescue mission. And we collected, in a couple weeks, we collected over a thousand pounds of coats. Wanted you to see just a little picture of it. And I just wanted to say, hey, I love you guys and I love your hearts. You're so generous. And I think that is awesome. Our, our church is also uh, just full of gratitude. And you're always writing notes. I get notes every week and I appreciate that. That's awesome. Got a note this last week. And uh, it's, uh, in fact, it's Burn. Burn gave me this card. And Burn sent me a card. I think it's the greatest thank you note I've ever gotten. I don't know where you got it, Burn, but I thought it was awesome. It says, thank you on the outside. And then I, I thought the inside was so great, I wanted to put it up on the screen. It says, the message on the cover may appear smaller than actual gratitude. <laughs> thank you, Burn. That's really cool. I love that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. It's in your notes. Everybody's going to need notes because there's something I'm going to ask you to do at the end of the service that you're going to have to have your notes in order to do. So everybody grab your notes today. This is really important. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. And what I want to do is I want you to read this verse. It's going to come up on the screen. I want you to read this out loud. And I want you to do it. I want you to do it thanksgiving in your heart. Okay, so here we go. Let's read it together. Let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for all that God has done. Let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for what God has done. Let me ask you a question. What would it look like in your life for, for, for that thanksgiving just to overflow on other people because you are so grateful for what God has done in your life. Today I want to give you one sentence and my goal is by the time that we get done today that this sentence becomes part of who you are in your life. Not just today, not just Thanksgiving, but my goal is that you would just start living this out in your life. Now here's what I want you to do and here's my goal. Everybody look up here just real quick. I'm going to give you, by the time we're done, I'm going to give you three parts of one sentence. One sentence sentence, three parts. But when we get done, I want you to commit today. Everybody raise your right hand and say, I commit. <laughs> you guys are so trusting. I love it. <laughs> so I want you to commit to, to every day this week to reading this one sentence, three parts, one sentence. Everybody say, okay, Craig, we're with you. Man, you guys are so good. You don't even know what the sentence is. Man, I love it. That is so awesome. So every day this week, I want, and, and the reason is that I want, to, I want this to impact your life. And uh, so let me give you the first part of this, and it has everything to do with that key verse, Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. Let, let our lives just overflow with thanksgiving and gratitude for what God has done. Amen? Amen. Man, I love that. Three parts of one sentence. Here we go. Here's the first part. When, the, when God's grace flows in, would you write that in? When the grace of God flows in. If you're going to understand gratitude, you got to understand grace. I, in the Christian community, we talk a lot about grace a lot, and, and there's so much in this little word that many times, I just wonder if we really grasp the, the grace of God and how, how majestic it is and the magnitude. There's so much wrapped up in the word of God's grace. It's kind of like, I hear some people look, and when they talk about the Grand Canyon, they talk about it like it's a hole in the ground. <laughs> Come on, it's more than that. There's more, it's, it's majestic, it's, it's, it, it, it's powerful. God's grace is, is big, there's so much to it. In the early verses of the book of, of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul begins to talk about the fact that we have been loved by God, we've been adopted into his family. Anybody in here you think that you deserve to be adopted into the family of God? <laughs> Because you are so good. <laughs> you know, we've got, we've got some really good people in our church. And I think about doing the, remember the picture we had of the, of the uh, uh, thousand pounds of, of coats? And, and I think of our Feed My Starving Children. I think of all the stuff that you do. And, and I, I just wonder if anybody in here today would go, yeah, Craig, you know, because of my goodness, I think I have earned a right to be adopted. I think I'm good enough to be adopted into the family of God. Anybody just want to stand up and go, I am so perfect that I did. No? Doesn't it just kind of turn your stomach a little bit when I even ask that? So Paul talks about God's grace in the context that God has now placed us into his family. Listen to these words, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Here's how he talks about grace. It brings praise to God because of his wonderful grace. God gave that grace to us freely in Christ, the one he loves. And in Christ, we're set free. 
by the blood of his death on the cross, and so we have forgiveness of sins. Anybody just, hey, Craig, just stop right there, because I just want to say amen and hallelujah. Anybody like that? Come on, that is so good. Now read this last line with me. How rich is God's grace. That's why we sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch. My hand is up. Anybody else? Come on, that saved a wretch like Craig Coulter, me. See, here's, what, here's my fear. Unless you realize how much you don't deserve the grace of God, it doesn't matter very much. But hold on, what if someone, what if someone were to ask you to give like a one sentence definition, short definition of God's grace? What do you think you would say to him? In, in terms of God's grace is a gift. It, it, here it is, here's what I think it is. It's getting what you do not earn and it's living a life that you do not deserve. That's what God's grace is. 1995, Major League Baseball went on strike. Anybody remember that? Few people. My fear is the next service, the third service, is not going to remember it at all. <laughs> They're going to go, they did? 1995, there was a strike in Major League Baseball, and all the contracted players, they were holding out for more money and, and uh, better benefits. And in the spring of that year, the owners got together, and the owners said, they determined, hey, listen, we're going to have baseball no matter what. And so they, they opened up their teams to virtually anybody. It was, it was hilarious, if you remember this. Anybody that could field a ground ball, anybody could, who could swing a baseball bat, some guys were coaching Little League Baseball one week, and the next week they were playing in the big leagues. And so Max Lucado, one of my favorite writers, he writes about this experience that happened in 1995. And here's what he writes. He says, the games were not fancy, mind you. One manager said his pitcher threw the ball so slowly that the radar gun couldn't clock it. <laughs> <laughs> he writes, but oh, did those guys have fun. They arrived before the park was open every day, oiling their gloves, cleaning their cleats. They thanked the attendants who washed their uniforms. They thanked the caterers for food. They thanked the fans for paying a dollar to come and watch them. These guys didn't see themselves as a blessing to baseball. They saw baseball was a blessing to them. In that short season, the Phillies gave away free hot dogs and sodas. In the, in, in the trade of the year, the Cleveland Indians gave five players to the Cincinnati Reds absolutely free. <laughs> So what made this intriguing? What made this so magical? Quite simple, he writes. These were all guys who were living a life they didn't deserve. And they were chosen not because they were good, but because they were willing. And they knew it. There was no jockeying for position. There was no second guessing the management. There was no strikes, no walkouts, no lockouts. These guys didn't even have names on the back of their jerseys. They were just thrilled to be on the team. Hmm. You know what that is? That's grace. And that's how you and I should feel. Just thrilled that God would allow us to be a part of his family. Anybody just say amen to that? Come on, not because we deserve it, not because we are so good, not because we've earned it, but because that's how God is. And, and it's been my experience that when I get up here and I start to talk about grace, I have people that are on two ends of the spectrum. I, I have one group of people, and they're those people in their minds, they, they have a hard time accepting a God who's all about grace. And, and for many years, some of us have been carrying around in our mind a picture of God that doesn't square with what the Bible says. And we have this picture of God being stern and firm, and he's got this zapper out. And if we, do any, if we don't do what's right, he's going to zap us good. And it's all about rules and regulations. And we walk around in fear that at some point we're going to step out of line. And for a lot of us who carry the image of God like that around in our hearts... We have a hard time with verses like Romans chapter 8, verse 31, where Paul says, we shall, what shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, come on, listen to this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Leave that verse up there for a second, John. Because I look at that verse and I think to myself, if God is for, that means that God is, it doesn't, watch how this works. It, it doesn't say that God might be for us. It doesn't say God has been in the past for us. It doesn't say he was or could be. It says God is for you today, right here, Oro Valley, November 24th at OVCN, God is 
for you. You don't have to wait in line. You don't have to come back tomorrow and it's not going to run out. It doesn't matter where you've been. doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter where your journey in life has taken you. God is for you today. That's grace. And I love mashed potatoes so much that I, I threw in a line and I would love it if maybe there were some people here today that would just pick up this line and maybe at the Thanksgiving table this, this Thursday, you would read this to your family because I think it's so powerful. Mashed potato writes again, he says, God is for you. If he had a calendar, your birthday would be circled. If he drove a car, your name would be on this bumper. If, if, if there's a tree in heaven, he's carved your name on the, on the trunk. Bound up and think about this, bound up in who God is in his nature, in this incredible character trait of God, he loves to bestow good things, grace gifts to undeserving people like you and me. That's who he is. That's part of his character. In the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 30, verse 18, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises, watch this, he rises to show compassion to you. Do you believe that? I mean, here's the the grand designer of the universe. Do you really believe that God who created the universe, that he really longs to be gracious to you personally? For some of us who came from very rigid religious background, this could be a liberating moment in our lives. You don't have to get God to like you. He already loves you. And it's not about you being good enough to somehow deserve God's favor in your life. He unconditionally loves you and he wants to grace you. He wants to fill your life with with grace that you don't deserve just because that's who he is. I knew somebody would just say, I can't, I can't help but not say amen right now. He's a loving Heavenly Father. And when you understand that, it changes everything on how you look at your life right now. So there's two groups of people. When I talk about grace, there's this group on the side. They can't handle, it's really hard for them to grasp a God of grace. But there's people on the other end of the spectrum. And they kind of look at, when I talk about grace, they go, well, I deserve it. <laughs> And I hear them say, well, Craig, you know, I, I'm not perfect. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Isn't it funny when people say that? I just want to go, well, that's kind of everybody, isn't it? And they say, well, well, I look around at other people and I compare my life to their life. And I think to myself, you know what? I feel pretty good about my life. And if God is grading on any bit of a curve, then I should do pretty well. I mean, if there's a certain amount of spots in heaven, I think I deserve to get one of those spots with how, how good, I think I'm good enough to get that. Hey, if that is your picture that you carry around in your mind of you, then you have an elevated view of yourself. And, and, and to be blunt with you, you have an elevated view of your relationship with God. Because honestly, the Bible paints a drastically different picture than that. In fact, the Bible says prior to us, to, prior to a person accepting Jesus Christ into their life, they are in a condition, we're all in a condition before that, that's described in the Bible with phrases like, there's not even one righteous, no one Or if you go to the Old Testament, you read about Jeremiah, and he writes, within every one of us, Jeremiah says, is a heart that's desperately wicked and deceitful. Isaiah says, we've all gone astray, even pastors. No. (laughs) Paul says in Ephesians that we are by nature, without Jesus Christ, we are by nature sinful creatures. Come on. When you understand how big and majestic and holy and perfect is our God, you begin to understand how small you are and I am. (laughs) And you understand how desperately you need God's grace in your life. But until you understand the darkness of your soul, then you will never fully appreciate God's grace in your life. Here's the good news. In spite of all that, in spite of how dark our soul can be, in spite of how big and majestic and holy and perfect our God is, listen to me, this is great news. And you're going you're gonna to want to make sure you remember this one. God loves you. And he chooses that. He chooses, he says, listen, I, I, 
I want to give you grace. I, I want to have a relation. My prayer is this Thanksgiving is that you will never get over what it means that God has invaded your life, that he chooses to pour grace into your life. And, and you wouldn't just go, well, you know, I, I, I said yes to Jesus a long ways back, and I'm kind of tired of that grace thing. No, no, no. I, I, I hope that this Thanksgiving that you would be overwhelmed, as that verse says that we started with, that you would be overwhelmed with what your Heavenly Father has done, how he's graced you, and that you, there would be something that would well up, and, and you wouldn't think you deserve it, but you would just go, wow, what an awesome God we serve. So the first thing you got to understand is that grace, God's grace flows into my life. Here's the second part of this one sentence that I want you to, I want you to take today, this Thanksgiving, and I really want you to live it throughout your whole life. And that is that gratitude, once grace comes in, God's grace comes in, gratitude in my life fills up. When I understand God's grace in my life, gratitude is the natural byproduct. But I also know from my own experience how quickly I can forget God's grace and how quickly I go to griping and complaining. Anybody with me in this? I'm in the front of the line today. (laughs) I was, I was, I was rushing around. I did baptism. So I got to get two sets of clothes here and I got to do all this stuff. And, and so I was rushing around getting going today and my wife was up and, 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 and and I, I I was just rushing. I didn't have time to talk with her and I, I was going to talk about grace today. (laughs) (laughs) She looks at me and she goes, Hey, could you just take just a moment and just give me a hug? Oh, man. I love, guys, come on. I love how our wives remind us of what's really important. And, amen? Any guy just feel really like, oh, man, that's, that's so true. When I forget God's grace, I begin to focus on not on what I have, but on what I don't have. And I, I think the best example of that is Adam and Eve in the Bible, and two people that are created in God's image, and God drops them in the middle of this place that's called, the Bible calls this paradise, call, calls it the, the, a perfect environment, and everything was there for their enjoyment. And the only thing that God withheld from Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve was one tree. Think about this. The Bible says it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but everything else, everything else was there for their enjoyment. So what do you think that they focused on. (laughs) And by the way, let me just make sure I be really biblical about this. It was Eve first and then Adam. (laughs) Any guys just want to say amen to get real courageous? But it was all about one thing. It was what they couldn't have. And it wasn't gratitude for all the stuff that God had provided for them. It was that one thing that God withheld. And, And we are so much like that. We are so quick to be moved to grumbling and complain. I, I, I came across, this is so great, it, it, it's St. Benedictine who was writing some guidelines as he was setting up a monastery and how it should function, how he wanted it to be, and one of the things he went hard after was this whole issue of ingratitude and grumbling. Listen to what he says. He says, firsthand, foremost... There must be no word or sign of grumbling, no manifestation of it for any reason. He just, he didn't leave it right there either. He was so serious about this grumbling and complaining in the monastery that a few lines later, he adds that. He says, let Father Abbot, he's talking about if, if, if a monk begins to show dis, uh, sow discord uh, among the brethren, he says, let Father Abbot send two stout monks to explain the matter to them. <laughs> So all of a sudden you, you complain and you gripe and you get a knock at your door. This is Guido and Luigi and we're here, to, uh, <laughs> we're here to straighten you out. So I thought, hey, at our church, this would be really cool, right? I'm thinking this is a good idea. So Craig Sawyer, come on. He's a Navy SEAL. Stand up, Craig. You are our official. You're, you're part of our complaint department right here. You're going to stand outside. And, and if anybody has a complaint, you go over to Craig. You give him the complaint and he'll deal with you appropriately. <laughs> I couldn't wait to do that today. That's so fun. (laughs) You ever have to remind your kids about this? This room you live in, I own this room. You ever have to tell your kids that? (laughs) The bed you sleep in, grace. (laughs) 
The fact that you live here, grace. The clothes you, you're wearing, grace. <laughs> and I wonder if sometimes God doesn't just look at us and just, come on. You know, the job you have, grace. grace. Come on. Your health, grace. grace. Oh, God, you know, I'm not, it's not actually perfect health. I actually have something wrong. No, Grace. Come on, the house you have, come on, pick this up. Everybody help me. The house you have is? Grace. So how about a little gratitude? And when we talk about gratitude, I'm not just talking about some polite little, you know, there's this thing that when my kids were growing up, they had an aunt that would give them a gift, and, and we would always give them the look. When they got the, the, the gift from this aunt, we would always give them the look like, you had better be polite. Even if you don't know what it is, you better say thank you for it. Anybody have the people that give you gifts that you don't know what they are? So I'm not talking about that kind. I'm talking about the kind of gratitude that resides voluntarily deep in your soul and creates joy and makes you less critical. So I want to try to paint a picture of the kind of gratitude that I think the Bible is talking about when it says, remember this first verse that we looked at, Colossians chapter 2. John, if you can throw it back up. Let your life overflow with thanksgiving, gratitude. So I want to give you three words on how to do that verse right there. And I want you to write these three words down. The first word is perspective. My gratitude, and I wrote this off to the side, my gratitude is not dependent on my circumstances. Let that one sit just for a little bit. True gratitude has nothing to do with what you have or you don't have. Uh, man, I got to work on that one a lot. I, 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 that, but when you buy into that, that's powerful. Has nothing to do whether you have a job or don't have a job. It does nothing to do. Your gratitude, your... Has nothing to do with your health or not health. Gratitude is not dependent on my circumstances. To help us out with this, I want you to meet a guy in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. He's one of those guys that has a strange name. And he wrote a book. He wrote a letter to God. And his name is uh, Habakkuk. Some of you are going, really? No, it's Habakkuk. But I, I love to say Habakkuk. I just think that's a cool name. Anybody with me on that? You say, Craig, you don't know how to say biblical names. Okay, yeah, I'll get that. But I have a whole lot more fun than you do that, no. <laughs> and Habakkuk wrote this book in the Old Testament. It's that part of the Bible where, where the, the pages are, are kind of, it's hard to get them apart because, you know, we don't go there very often. So they're kind of stuck together a little bit. And, and Habakkuk starts off his book by complaining and griping to God. And here's basically what he says. Chapter one, he says, dear God, and I, I, I'm just kind of summarizing here. I don't have time to read it all. But he says, I find myself, God, play, praying all the time, but nothing ever happens. <laughs> gripe, 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 gripe. And uh, he says, I look around and all the injustice in the world. And he says, it seems like the wicked people, they're prospering, and all the righteous people, they're suffering. So God, what are you going to do about it? And when are you going to show up? And he's got this long list of stuff that he's complaining to God about. But here's what's interesting. If you go from chapter one, kind of skip chapter two, go to chapter three. In verse 17, here's what he says. And I'm going to throw this up on the screen. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine and though the olive crop fails and produces the fields produce no food though there are no sheep in the pen or cattle in the stalls anybody see this come on every time i read this it's emotional for me because i go come on his life is basically there is nothing hardly to be grateful for and yet he comes down to the end and he says and yet i will be joyful in god my savior anybody just say amen to that so I look at that and I think to myself, okay, what happened between chapter one and chapter three? What are the circumstances that changed? I want to tell you something today. You got to look up here. Hear me on this. Between chapter one, what happened between chapter one and chapter three? And I want to tell you absolutely nothing. Nothing in Habakkuk's circumstances changed. There's one thing that did change. It's his perspective. 
For him to be able now to come and say, hey, even if there are no grapes in the vine, and even if there are no crops of oils this year, and even if there are no sheep or cattle in the stalls, yet I'm going to still have joy in my heart. Come on, there will always be something in your life that you'll be able to be grateful for. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Come on, that's so huge. Perspective, hey, I, I can be thankful regardless of my circumstances. So number two, the first word is perspective. The second word that describes and shows us how to live out that verse, Colossians chapter two, verse seven. The second word is the word protection. Now, I love this. This is so powerful. I want to talk just a minute about guarding your heart with gratitude, guarding your heart with gratitude. In the Christian life, there are many things that I think of as, as like spiritual diseases of our heart. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them in just a bit. There's many of them. But no matter what the symptom of, of, our, of our heart, our spiritual heart that has disease, listen, I want to tell you what I found to be the prescription for healing, and that's found in a large dose of gratitude. You go to Ephesians chapter 5, and Paul says, obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not of you. That's not supposed to be part of your life. And then he turns around, and he says, instead, there, there should be thankfulness to God. Now, I'm not sure, leave that verse up there just for a second. I'm not sure how you look at that verse, but I think to myself, those, do, those two don't equal out. When I think of, of uh, inappropriate talk or obscene language, and, and, and I, I don't, how does Paul go from that to, to gratitude? And here's what I think Paul is saying. When you place in your heart gratitude, when thankfulness fills up your soul, it changes what comes out of your mouth. Amen. Let's say, for example, you struggle with a critical spirit. How many of you are going to have family around Thanksgiving? Would you just raise your hand? Mm. And there's that person, and you just want to be so critical of them. I mean, anytime you're around, you know right now, there's something inside you that goes, ooh, I'm going to have such a hard time at Thanksgiving. Don't raise your hand, but I'm going to raise my hand, okay? <laughs> I just kind of want to lead the charge. I know there's a silent group of people that are going, yeah, it's tough. And you know what? You have that critical spirit. The problem, here, listen, the problem is that you have an ungrateful heart. And so my advice, the, the, the cure, the prescription would be, okay, this week, work on your gratitude. Begin to, to look for those things in your life and in them that you're sitting around the table with that you can be grateful for. Maybe some of you are struggling with bitterness in your marriage. And my encouragement to you is, is look for ways to be grateful for your spouse. Be, be thankful for who they are. Be thankful for what they do and begin to express out loud to them genuinely. <laughs> please hear me on that. Your appreciation for them and see what God begins to do in your heart because you are speaking with a heart of gratitude. Guard your heart. I love that phrase, guard your heart with gratitude. Let me give you another word that, that, that on how you live out, let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for what God has done. Here's the third way you do that, and, and, and it's practice. Would you write that down, practice? Here's, here's the good news today. You get to choose whether you're going to be a grateful person or not. Your choice. Friday night, Rosie, our granddaughter, 16 months old, came over and uh, we, uh, we, we celebrated a birthday of Connors and, uh, and, and then Rosie, we worked it out so Rosie would, how many grandparents, you just go, having your grandkids come over and spend the night is the greatest thing in the world. Anybody with me on that? I love that. So she comes over and, uh, and it was about her bedtime and so I, I, I looked at her and I said, and, and, and 60 months, she understands so much and I just think, how do you know what I'm saying? But I looked at her and I said, Rosie, it's time for bed. Would you rather go to bed or would you like to crawl up in Lolly's lap and would you like to uh, watch Frozen, the movie? <laughs> So she just jumps right up into her grandmother's arms, and uh, about a half hour later, she was ready for bed, and so I went in and put her to sleep. And about an hour after that, I walked into her room just to kind of check on her, make sure she... Have you ever noticed that your kids are most precious when they're sleeping? Anybody know that? <laughs> so I walk over, and I look at her sleeping just so still. And I just prayed. I said, God, thank you so much for this, this incredible gift of a granddaughter. We're so happy. She brings so much joy to our hearts. 
Last Sunday, we took communion. If you were here, you know that. And our church is uh, growing so fast. We're in three services. And one of the things we always worry about, <laughs> as I look back at that clock right now, oh, Lance, is we attempt to get everything done in 65 minutes. That's our goal. So last Sunday, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm leading everybody in taking communion together. And I take that piece of bread. I, I, I feel like I'm a pretty quick eater, but when I get to communion, there's something about that bread. It takes forever to eat. Anybody with me in that? So I put it in my mouth and I start chewing and I chew, 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 chew. And finally I come, I think I'm going to swallow and only half of it goes down. So then I got to swallow again. And, and I'm going, this is, come on. And all of a sudden it hit me. Do I really take, take time when we take communion to linger and to stop? And to say, thank you to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. Thank you for for your shed blood for my life, for my sins. And thank you for the fact that you died on my behalf. See, here's what I know. Until you learn to linger, until you stay in that moment, until you say thanks, you will never be a person that's marked by gratitude. Would you practice with me right now? Would you hold up your, you held up your right hand earlier. Would you hold up your left hand just for a second? Just hold it up just like this. Come on, everybody. You think, well, you're tricking us. No, I'm not tricking you. Just hold up your left hand. You know, here's what I know. Okay, you can bring it back down, but here's what I want you to know. I, uh, uh, the left hand, uh, especially your hand, it's all these muscles and bones and, and uh, it's a medical marvel. I've, I've uh, messed up my wrist and I, I don't even know what I did, but the doctor, I went to the doctor and I've kind of been studying wrists and, and I found out the doctor is... Uh, he looks at my wrist through the x-ray and he just goes, Craig, this is crazy. It is nuts. This is unbelievable. And I go, what? okay. And uh, he shows me where it's all messed up and stuff. But here's what I know about my left hand when I look at it. Number one, I have a watch. It's really a Fitbit, but I use, use it as a watch. And here's what I know is that every second, every second that I see on there, it's a gift from God. I didn't create I don't have the power to create any seconds. And God says, listen, Craig, I've graced those seconds to you. It's a gift. On my left hand, I wear a wedding ring, and that wedding ring is a symbol of a commitment that I made in my heart over 34 years ago to the most important person in my life, my wife, Robin. And, and that ring reminds me of, of, of the most important relationship in, in, in my life, my marriage together with Robin. And it's a gift it's, that I'm so unbelievably thankful for. And, and God gave you that left hand so that you could reach out and you could touch people. A lot of times, sometimes when you, when you touch a person, it, it communicates, hey, I'm grateful for you. And I want you to do something right now. Some of you already have your, your arm around your spi- spouse, but even if, if you're sitting next to a spouse or a friend, somebody you know pretty good, listen, if it's a, if it's a stranger, don't you dare do this. <laughs> but if you know the person, would you just right now just reach out and just touch their shoulder? Or would you just reach out and, and pat them on the back or put your arm or whatever you do? And, and listen, I, I want to make sure you know that that. It's a way of communicating, hey, I'm grateful for you in my life. Psalm 118, verse 24, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. Listen, that verse right there, it doesn't talk about yesterday because you can't go back and change yesterday. It doesn't talk about tomorrow because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But the one thing that you can own is what you choose to do with today, right now. So I want to encourage you to do something. I I want you to make today, between now and when your head hits the pillow when you fall asleep tonight, I want to encourage you to make today, this day, a no-complaint day. (laughs) I saw some of your faces go, "Mm, mm, mm, mm." (laughs) mm-mm, mm-mm. Today, no griping. Today, you just look at each other and go, you know what, we're, we're not complaining. So I, I got to keep on moving. So, so let, let's review. When God's grace flows in, gratitude fills up. And then there's a third part that I quickly want to give you. God's grace comes in, gratitude fills up my heart, and then generosity flows out. That's the third part of the sentence. When people realize they're getting something so incredible from God that they don't deserve, that they, their hearts have been invaded by God's grace, 
They're then filled with gratitude. And then you know what happens next? All of a sudden, it begins to show out, overflow. In, it shows in your faces because you smile more. It begins to show in your words because you're kinder in what you say. It begins to show in your actions because you're more generous with people. You're, you're more loving to people. We have the greatest administrative team in our church. I mean, the people in the office, they are just awesome. I went to them late in the week, and I said, I don't know if you can do this, but, but man, if you could put this card together, this would be so cool. And I said, hey, on, the, on, the, uh, on one side, if you put Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, we talked about it this summer. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. Do, do you guys see this? We put them in your bulletin. They slipped them in there. And, and I just saw them today. I, I said, here's what I want you to do. And then they made it so much better than I ever thought it could be. But on the flip side, on the back side, there's a place for the person's name. And then it says, I'm grateful for you. Thanks for making a difference in my life. And then it's a place for you to sign. And I thought, you know, how cool would it be to take these and maybe somebody in your life that's made a huge difference, maybe it's somebody that when you came in this morning, you were kind of down and discouraged and they greeted you and it just kind of lifted your spirits and you would just go, hey, I want to give you this card. You made a difference in my life. Maybe it's one of your kids' Sunday school teachers and, and, and you would realize how important they are that your, your kids' Sunday school teacher is teaching the same things that you are teaching your kids and that you would just go, hey, I just want to make sure you know how grateful I am for you teaching my child. Or maybe it's when you go to lunch or, or go to Safeway and, 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 and there's somebody that just encourages you and lifts you up and you would say, hey, listen, I, I have this card. I want to give it to you because I think you make a difference in my life. It's just a way to say thanks. Wow. Let me close with this story. Luke chapter seven. It'll take about a half an hour more. Everybody have a half hour more? <laughs> just real quick. Jesus is having dinner with Simon. Simon is a Pharisee. When I think of the Pharisees, the thing that I think of, I'm a pretty simple person. When I think of the Pharisees, I think of the fact that they are, they are not fair, you see. Anybody with me on that? Some of you going, that's stupid. Yeah, but you're going to be saying it later. You're going to tell somebody that. It, it's kind of an exclusive party, and on this particular night, the Bible says that in walks this uninvited woman, and the Bible doesn't say a lot about this woman. The Bible just simply says that she has lived a life, a sinful life, and, and, and she walks in uninvited, and the Bible says she goes up to Jesus, and she's so overcome with emotion that she begins to weep, and tears begin to roll out of her eyes and down her cheek, and, 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 and all of a sudden, it begins to literally drip on, on, down on the feet of Jesus. She's standing right in front of him, and the Bible says that she gently kneels down and she takes her hair and she begins to wipe the tears off of Jesus' feet. And in that moment, she's so overcome with gratitude, thanksgiving, that she kisses the feet of Jesus. Imagine this. And she pours this expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. There's just something when I read that story that I just look at and I go, man, I would love to have been there because that had to have been a moment. Anybody with me? Think how powerful that was. And here's Simon, the Pharisee, and he begins to get upset. He's incensed at what she has done, how she's interrupted them and, and what she's doing. And, and she knows that, that, what, that what, what, Jesus knows what this guy Simon is thinking. And, and he, he, he tells this parable of two guys that were in debt and how grateful one of them was when, when he realized that his debt had been for huge debt. And somebody, the master just says, your debt's been forgiven. You're free. And how grateful he was. And, and then Jesus looks at this woman and he says about her, he says, her sins, which were many, <laughs> which I just, when he says that, I just want to go, me too. My hand's the only one up. Anybody with me? Her sins, which were many, have all been forgiven. Come on, that's grace. And so she had shown me much love. I don't want you to miss this. I, if you didn't hear anything else in the sermon today, this is the part that I want you to hear, and then we're done. Come on. This is so important. And that is that, come on, just like that woman, God's grace has forgiven me of all my sin, and because of that grace, my heart is filled with gratitude to God. Come on, if you're sitting here today and you're going, ah, no big deal, you don't understand grace. Come on. 
Because God's grace has forgiven me and forgiven me of all my sin, and I stand before you, not because of anything I've done, not because I'm perfect, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. I stand before you and say, hey, listen, I get to have a relationship with God. That is God's grace in my life, and I'm thrilled for it. God's grace comes down. Come on, you're going to need to remember this. God's grace comes down. Gratitude goes up, and generosity goes out. How I live my life, it's been changed because of God's amazing grace. So last line in your bulletin, do you see that? It's big and it's bold, it's three lines. It's one sentence, it's three parts. Everybody got this? Read this out loud with me. When the grace flows in, the gratitude fills up, and the generosity flows out. My prayer for you today, look up here. My prayer for you today is this. Heavenly Father, may this, these three lines of this one sentence, may this be the story of our lives today. And may this be the story of our life on Thanksgiving that we'll be able to share it with some people around a Thanksgiving table. And, man, this is, way, this is going way out in this prayer. But my prayer for you is that you would see this sentence right here as the way you live out your life from now on. This is it right here. God's grace comes in. My gratitude goes up. And my generosity to others goes out. Amen?